Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Scleral Lens Education Society's May webinar. I'm Dr. Ashley Tucker. I will be your moderator for this evening. I am so excited to welcome Dr. Roria Habibi. She will be talking to us about masterclass and scleral lens logistics. So just a little information about Dr. Habibi. So Dr. Habibi received a doctorate of optometry from the University of California, Berkeley, excuse me, School of Optometry, and completed a medical contact lens fellowship at KCI Institute. After completing her studies, she joined a group practice in Seattle, Washington, where she developed and launched the Center for Eye Comfort, a full service dry eye center. She was the lead eye care provider for Seattle Cancer Center Alliance's chronic ocular GVHD clinic, providing advanced care to all long-term patients in their care. And she was the lead investigator in a clinical trial testing allogenic serum drops as a treatment of ocular GVHD. After years in Seattle, Dr. Habibi decided to move with her family to Tamarindo, Costa Rica, where she opened a concierge eye clinic. She is hosting an advanced fellowship program to train local optometrists the skills she has acquired. In her free time, she is the host of the top eye Eye Care Podcast, Try Not to Blink. She's a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry on the fellowship board of the Scleral Lens Education Society and has published many works, including a recent case study in cornea. Welcome, Dr. Habibi. Thank you, Dr. Tucker. That was so kind. Oh, you're welcome, my dear. All right. All right. I'm turning it over to you. Thank you so much for that kind intro, Dr. Tucker. Thank you, Maureen, and all of the SLS for coordinating this awesome series. The scleral lens fundamentals as this third part of this series, um, there are building blocks and that obviously essential to mastering the skill of scleral lenses. And honestly, I'm really honored to be able to teach you all tonight these skills. Um, tune in, we're gonna talk about it at the end that there's a larger scleral lens soiree that is coming up. That's gonna be talking much more advanced level scleral lens things. But today's topic I'm really excited about because in my fellowship that we've been working uh, that we've started at uh, Ojos del Mar in Costa Rica, I realized that a lot of the logistics that you need to truly excel at fitting scleral lenses aren't really laid out in a nice map for, for new learners. And it really is a uh, stumble if you aren't smoothly knowing how to fit a scleral lens and all the other things not fitting scleral lenses. So let me tell you a little about myself. Dr. Tucker kind of already breezed, or went through most of these things, but I'll say that my first year in my fellowship at KCI, I fit about 800 unique cases. So I got a pretty quick learn on how to fit scleral lenses, both the technical skill and the other things that I'm gonna talk about in today's lecture. And then in my, my next job, six years, I was in Seattle. And through those, those years, I started as, you know, your lowly fresh optometrist. And I grew to be within, within one of the distributors in the US, one of their top accounts. So prescribing a lot of scleral lenses each day and in a busy week, I would prescribe 20 to 30 new clients a week. So a lot of fitting, a lot of, logistics that goes into making that smooth. So I'll take a step back and I wanted to say in the past two decades, 250% increase in fitting scleral lenses. And that's a really big increase in a really short time. And a lot of us know this scleral lens is a hot topic and there's been so many great education resources. The SLS is a great opportunity for anyone who is just starting to dabble into the options that are available through SLS. Uh, definitely dive into the old resources that are available because they're very, very good. But just like a lot of the business aspects of eye care and optometry in general, what truly upgrades you to a master in your skill and in your niche is knowing the little things to be able to seamlessly incorporate this into your clinic. So there's so much more that limits people to their success level. And tonight I wanna to be able to kind of cover these hot topics so you can master, truly master scleral lens fitting. So what is scleral lens success? I wanna talk about it. So in my opinion, scleral lens success is everything but the fit, right? The fit you can master, you know, there are definitely things in a fit that are hard and that you learn with time and with expertise and with technology, but the other steps to fitting are very important to learn. 
So I'm gonna break it down tonight in four steps, okay? Number one, before fitting. Number two, during the fit, but not the fit. Number three, the dispense. And number four, the follow. -up. So first is before the fit. This is your new, whether it's your brand new in the clinic or just your fresh day in clinic, what are you gonna need to fit your patient in a slur lens, okay? So we'll talk about the supplies, your tools. We'll talk about policies. So do you have a system? What's the patient can expect, et cetera? Um, what patient information are you gonna collect or what do you need from the patient to be able to start this process? And then how are you gonna prepare your lenses, right? So number one, devices. I'll say that the fitting set, <laughs> took a picture of some of the fitting sets that we have at our office, but I see this question so commonly in forums is, especially in young fitters, how many fitting sets do I need? Or how many, like, which ones do I need to get started? Or what's the best fitting set? And honestly, like while I have a couple of the fitting sets that I own pictured, I'll say that truly one or two fitting sets is what I really use the most, right? And that really narrows down a couple ways. Number one, and in my opinion, it might be the most crucial is communication, both communicating with your lab. Like how is it, e how easy is it to communicate with your lab? One prime example is like, you might think, okay, yeah, it's easy. I like talking to this lab. So that's obviously communication, but I think more importantly, in the past I was in Seattle. If you're in Seattle and you're trying to communicate with a lab that closes early on the East coast and you're trying to order at the end of the day, that's really hard logistically to do. Or vice versa, if you try, if you like ordering early in the morning and your lab's on the West Coast and you're on the East Coast, again, they're not going to be open. So that's a logistic thing to consider. So picking a lab that's close to you geographically, not only is it helpful to communicate, but it's also easier to get a lens in a pinch. Like if you need a lens for some, your patient calls and says, I broke my lens, doc, help me send it tomorrow. If they live on the other coast, it's a little harder logistically to get it fast versus they may help you out if they live in a closer radius, they could maybe get it to you the next day. So something to consider there. So people you enjoy working with, you're gonna call call into different labs and talk to different labs and troubleshoot. So talking to the different consultants helps, but truly you're gonna master whatever fitting set you have. So don't let getting a new fitting set be an obstacle for starting fitting. And then secondly, your plungers. You need plungers. While some people, and I'm gonna talk about different ways to put lenses on and off, having the basic set of plungers, most fitting sets actually do come with them nowadays. You can kind of see it if you look real close in the picture, <laughs> two of the fitting sets right there. But the plunger for application plunger, which is the bigger white one, and the removal plunger, which is the smaller one. You need to have those in stock at all times, clean and handy and ready to come. Solutions. So. The disinfecting solution, the cleaning solution, we'll talk about that first. So most of the time we have these sitting around the clinic anyways, but having both a multi-purpose solution, whether it be the Boston has products, the Boston Long has products, Medicon has products, um, but also having disinfecting products like a hydrogen peroxide, you're going to need both of those in your clinic. And then a preservative-free saline solution. This one might be a little bit more odd to consider for some docs if you're not already, if you don't already fit scleral lenses. But I think it's crucial not only for scleral lens wear, but also is excellent for your dry eye practice. So I think everyone should have preservative-free saline handy at all times, both for scleral lens filling and for, um, I use it on saline strips or on uh, fluorescein strips when checking for dry eye all the time. It's the best way of least irritating to the eye. So having these two, two things stocked in your clinic is a must have. Now is policy. Now this sounds like, like a lot of words and a lot of like, I don't know, procedure and why do I want to do this? But this is one of the biggest headaches I think a lot of new fitters don't necessarily consider because you're all rare up and excited to fit a scleral lens, but you don't think necessarily about the, <laughs> the questions that come up for, for your patients because they're investing a lot of money and time and they're scared and all these things with a scleral lens. You need to have a, a policy in place that's going to tell the, the patient and to be honest, your staff, what to expect with these lenses. So number one, what's your policy? Like, what is your, what do you expect to anticipate? What do you anticipate when you're fitting? 
Are the, how many times are they gonna have to come back? What does a fitting look like to you? Um, what is the period of time that you usually cover? Do you have a window of time that you cover? What is the fees? Is it one eye or both eyes? How much are the contact lenses? Do you, are you gonna charge extra for certain upgrades, whether it be a hydroped coating or multifocal lens? And then what if a lot of comes up almost every time, especially in the beginning, and especially if you aren't just bold with confidence about your fitting, fitting ability, people are going to say, well, what if this doesn't work, doc? What is my, what is my warranty policy? Or what is my, can I return the lenses if they don't work for me? Um, so you need to have that decided and, and written out so that you don't have to backpedal in the future when you've already spent your lab bills. Um, and then your warranty period. So can you get exchanges for your lenses? I think it's really wise to not only have those answers in your mind, but also put it in writing. So set those expectations in advance for your patients so they know, and they actually have it in writing. You could have it in a nice little contract for them, filling in the start date, filling in the end of the warranty date, filling in all these things and giving them a copy. These, these uh, different contracts are available if you go um, there's some great ones in the business of scleral lens. Um, Dr. Stephanie Wu has put that together and there's an ama a, lots of amazing guides that you can use for um, references. So you can kind of take it and make it your own, but it's really helpful because nothing's worse than doing all this work. And then someone changes their mind or, you know, goes far beyond their warranty and tries to guilt you into helping them. So don't make this burn your clinic. And I know this was also talked about in one of the first lectures, but don't make this burn your clinic. Just have a plan straight ahead so you don't have to worry about it in the future. Okay, so next information needed to start. These are a couple of things that uh, you're gonna see. So prescription, of course, we're always curious about this. I think it's crucial. Everyone that you fit in a scleral lens, I think must have backup glasses, even if they're seeing like, 20, 50, 20, 60, 20, 70, whatever. Everyone should have a prescription pair of glasses. Another thing is HVID. A lot of the fitting sets give a recommendation of starting point based on HVID. <clears throat> so that's a nice thing to collect. K values, of course, this often helps figure out the starting base curve of the lens in many of the different fitting sets. Also, then it helps you guide uh, or monitor whatever ocular disease or whatever problem is happening in the eye that, the, that you are also monitoring. Insurance, applicable, you need to figure out their insurance information. You, they're going to probably be asking for prior authorizations, depending on what insurance company it is. So getting that information ready and that information pulled, because if you don't have prior authorizations or if you haven't investigated the insurance coverage before you start the discussion, you are gonna delay your starting time because of course your client's gonna want to know if their insurance is gonna cover this. And then lastly, this one's a big asterisk that I like to say because when a patient already has contact lenses and they wanna work off their old contact lenses, you need that information and not just, you know, I wear, you know, AccuView one days, right? Like this vague answer of what kind of contacts they use. You need to actually, I would request, if you are going to allow for the option to modify any old parameters, especially if it's a different doctor that fit these lenses, I would highly, highly advise getting the previous lab invoice from the previous doctor. Otherwise, you're trying to modify something that is just, it could have customized uh, peripheral curves, it could have so many customizations, or even in some of my old lenses that I fit, I had High order of, higher order aberration powers within the lens that could have never been duplicated without that information from the lab. So getting the lab information is crucial to be able to replicate that lens. But most importantly, and this is kind of like cheesy, but you just need a patient with eyes, right? So you need a patient with eyes to start. And um, next you want to prepare your lens, okay? So, most of us, especially if you're not fitting super often, you're gonna have your lenses in your fitting kit and most fitting kits are gonna send you lenses that are dry. So when you put a dry lens in the eye, this is going to ruin everyone's experience. It's gonna ruin yours because the lens is not gonna wet in the eye and you can't over refract. It's ruined the patient's experience because when that lens goes into their eye, it feels super 
uncomfortable. It feels bad. It feels like a corneal GP lens. So what I like to do is clean the lens just with the uh, multi-purpose gas permeable solution, massage the lens. I actually use my fingers to massage into the front surface of the lens, that GP solution, and then soak the lens in that same solution. Ideally soaking for at least an hour or two, if you can. If anything, prep your fitting set in the morning when you know you have a fit. And that way you don't have to worry about just struggling through the fitting because it really does ruin both your experience and theirs. Okay, so now we've gotten past the first step and we're getting into the actual process of fitting, okay? So we, of course, everyone, like the hottest thing is knowing how to evaluate and fit a scleral lens. Now, I wanna talk about the other stuff that goes into the actual fit process, right? Selecting the lenses, inserting, accepting, do I even leave the lens in or not? How do you record? What do you order? And how do you disinfect? But let's just break these steps down so we can digest it a little better. And again, I'm skipping out on this evaluation and fitting stage. So I'm just gonna pick one lens set here. So lens selection, okay? There's, you open every single fitting get set and they all kind of have a vibe like this, right? You look at all the lenses, it immediately looks, immediately looks overwhelming, but I wanna break it down a little. So when you select your first lens, the instructions from every lab or every manufacturer, they give you different instructions. So I'm gonna zoom in on the instructions here. So essentially with this manufacturer, they say you're gonna find your flat K, but I'm zooming a little bit more. You're gonna find your flat K, you're gonna multiply it by 100, and then that's your side you're gonna go for, right? So I gave an example of someone's a 4250 by 44. You take the 4250 in microns, and now we're gonna go back to the fitting kit, and we're gonna pick the lens in this kit that close, most closely man uh, matches the microns that is on the, that is their flat K, right? And that's basically helping you select which lens should I start with. But I want to just give you a little, um, I don't know, let's call it a pro tip maybe, is to be honest, you find your kit, within your kit, you find the lens that you like your best, but your favorite lens. So in this particular kit, maybe my favorite lens is this lens here. It's the 42 base curve, 4,500 SAG lens. It's my go-to lens perhaps. And I'm going to pick that one every time. Why? Why do I have a favorite lens? Because truly, like, this is obviously the rationale. You pick between high and low. So in the middle, ideally, because you have two directions to go, down or up. If you pick way too flat, you don't know how far up you have to go. If you pick way too steep, you're going to have to go the back direction. So pick right in the middle. And then um, it, it just makes a decision. You don't have to make a decision, right? Don't waste the time. A lot of us happen to be in busy practices where you don't have the time to sit and do the math and find the case first, right? So in my previous clinic in, in Seattle, I saw up to 25 patients a day and I didn't always have time. Like we had technicians that ran a lot of our special tests. We didn't always have time to get the, the K measurements before we did this lateral lens training. So don't let picking a lens be your obstacle for fitting a lens. Cause I feel like that is one of the hardest obstacles to get past is just figuring out where to start. Okay, next is inserting the lens. I will say that keeping your patient's expectation high through this process is crucial because especially for a brand new lens fitter, they are scared usually because they think, oh, that big lens is going to feel terrible. And it's so, it's scary. They're, they're nervous about it. So keeping them trusting you the whole time is really crucial. Aim to get the lens in the first time. It doesn't always happen, but if you can do it, it will just make the process better for all parties. So here is my kind of breakdown on how to get the lens in. Instruction or how you instruct the patient is crucial. So number one, here's my lovely assistant here, Dr. Fabiola, our doctor in a, my, my fellow at our clinic. So you're going to ask your client or your patient to lean forward. You're going to have her tucked chin to your chest, and you're going to instruct them to put their forehead parallel to their legs. From your perspective, what you're going to do, I uh, 
from the expert advice of Dr. Lynette Johns. She, I had the privilege of learning from her in the past, but she did the same technique and it's worked for me ever since. She put her hand over, I rest the head, my hand on the back of the patient's head for two reasons. Number one, to brace her hand and number two, <laughs> to keep them from bucking their head back, right? So it gives them something to rest their head on as they get a little bit nervous as you bring something close to their, their face. So you rest the arm on their head. You're, I'm gonna hold the upper lid with my top hand. And then with the hand that I'm holding the lens, I'm gonna use my middle finger to pull the lower lid down, okay? It's super helpful though, to give your patient some, a target, right? So if you give them a target, whether it's looking at the lens or if they're really you know, flinching or looking around, I will have them even sometimes like tap their hands on their lap and ask them to look at their fingers as they tap, or I'll even maybe put a screen if it's somebody, a younger kid or something like that, something visually interesting for them to look at. If they're really struggling or a, a common thing that'll happen is people will roll their eyes up every time you put the lens on. And as you know, if you don't put the lens straight on the cornea, it's not gonna go on. So if it keeps going and their eye keeps rolling up and you're not able to get the lens right onto the cornea before that saline spills out, another pro, trick, pro tip that I have is that I love using gel in the bowl of the lens. So if you put a couple drops of something like Cellubisc, Cellubisc is a, a preservative free gel. It's kind of hard to find right now, at least in the US market, but it's, amazing because it makes it so easy to put the lens on. You could almost put the lens on just horizontally. And then this is a last resort that I use, but to be honest, sometimes you have to go to last resorts if you can't get the lens in, is sometimes I'll numb the eye. So again, this is more of a phys phys uh, like a mental thing for people because they know as you're numbing the eye, you're numbing the eye, they're not going to feel it. But it also helps them with the flinch reflex and their bells reflex. So last resort, I'll try a time or two, but if I really can't get the lens in, now maybe I can be another option to help. But again, confidence is key. If I go in once or twice, number one, I'm gonna be drying the lids every time because the more slippery everything gets, the more likely you're not gonna get the lens in. But um, if, if you are exuding confidence, that's gonna really help. So if I'm starting to get nervous or if I'm sweating or if I'm telling them I'm getting nervous, then they're, you're not gonna get the lens in. Versus just saying like, oh, no problem. Third time's a charm, I'm gonna get it in. Like that, that helps a lot too. Okay, so once you get the lens in, a lot of, and then the next thing, next category we're gonna eventually lead into is looking at the lens and evaluating the lens on the eye. But we need to understand when is the trial lens okay to keep in the eye and even to look at? Or when is it not even acceptable for fitting? So I'm going to play a little game with the help of our, we have a voting thing in a minute, a voting, voting box is going to pop up, but I want you to vote yes or no on whether we should keep the lens in the eye to evaluate the fit, or if it's not good enough and we need to change to a different lens. Okay. So here's the first lens. You can, you put the lens on the eye, fluorescein's in the end, fluorescein's in the end, fluorescein is in the eye. Do you think that you should keep this lens in the eye or if it needs to be removed before you carry on, evaluate over refract? Vote now. I think a voting box is gonna pop up. <laughs> we'll wait a couple seconds. Everyone get your votes in. And I think we should evaluate. Ready? Let's see what everyone says. Good. 90% of you said no, not acceptable. Agreed. This is a, a definite no. The main reason is what we're looking at here is fluorescein, but we're looking at a large central bubble. And to be honest, any bubble about this size, and obviously if it's bigger, it's basically not useful at all. One thing I might just peek out real quick is, is this touching or is there, is this like good clearance ish or do I need to go steeper or flatter or is it like a thousand clearance? And that's why I have that bubble. Cause it's just, I didn't put enough fluorescein in. Um, but you're going to take this out cause you can't over back this. And to be honest, this is going to start feeling uncomfortable to your patient. Okay. Next game vote here. The lens is in, it's about 600 microns. As you can see, do we leave it in or do we change it? Vote. There you go. 
Okay, we're gonna wait a couple seconds. All right, plus pull. All right. Oh, 50-50 here, I like this. Okay, so it actually is 48% yes and 52% no. In my opinion, I would definitely keep this lens in. Yes, there's too much clearance. Am I gonna order this lens? No. But am I gonna keep it in, let it settle a little and over refract and evaluate? Yeah, actually. In fact, to be honest, I sort of like when there's too much clearance because a heavy lens is going to make some fit, like some uh, fit flaws much more obvious. A heavy lens is gonna make the lens decenter much more easily. And it's gonna make the edge, uh, you know, imperfections, like if the edge is, is impinging or if the edge is, you know, if there's an elbow impingement or whatever, if there's edge lip, you're gonna see it way more easy because if the lens is so heavy and is, you know, pressing down into the conge more, it's even easier to notice. So obviously we're gonna decrease clearance here, but I would not take this lens out of outlet it set. Okay, next. Here, vote. Soon, okay, here we go. What do we have here and can we leave it and just evaluate or no? And close poll. I liked it. Okay, 77% of you said no and 23% of you said yes. Okay, in this scenario, you have central touch, okay? And we know a central touch, it could be, we don't see fluorescein less than about 80 microns to the, to the eye, we just don't see it. But with this much central touch, to be honest, I would take it out. Because the problem is if this person has a very steep, perhaps a little nipple cone, we don't know how much it's touching and they could have a much deeper cone that would require much more sagittal height or depth to be able to clear that. So I go to the point of clearance. If it's barely touching or just barely, like you kind of see at the top edge of the black, maybe I would consider it. Or if I can see a small amount of fluorescein, I would maybe keep that. But this I would take out and move it because again, I need to know what's going to actually clear this point. In. Okay, and here we got another vote. So how about it? keep it on or take it off? Right, excited to see the results and vote. Okay, 72% of you said don't change, or sorry, 72% said it's not acceptable change and 28% said it's acceptable, keep it. Okay, for this, this is definitely something we are going to refit or adjust. We are gonna adjust these edges, but in most fitting kits, you don't have anything to change, right? So taking this lens out and putting a different lens in isn't going to change the edge profile. Most of the edge profiles and all the lenses are the same. You may have a set that has you know, a standard or, you know, a circular uh, peripheral zone or landing zone versus a toric haptic or toric landing zone. And in which case it might be interesting to see the other lens. But if you don't have that option, to be honest, it's going to be an acceptable fit because otherwise the lens looks good. You just know that you're going to change these. Things. So I wouldn't take it out. In my clinic, I wouldn't take it out. I would look at this and I would know how to change it. Okay, I will keep this. All right, this is the last vote here. So vote, put lines in, you see this, what would you do? Would you accept the fit and carry on or would you take the lens out and put something else? Okay, and, and vote. Okay, good. So 36% of you said, keep the fit keep the lens and 64% of you said, no, change it. And I agree, 64% of you, I agree with that. This lens is not wet and well, right? So the lens is totally beating up, the fluid is beating up on the surface. This lens not only doesn't fit well or feel good to the patient, but you're not gonna be able to refract well. This probably is gonna see like 2100 and maybe have the potential to see 
2020, or it could be 2050, but regardless, you're not going to get an accurate re over refraction of this lens and your patient's going to be skeptical. So unfortunately, when this happens, you got to take the lens out. And this one's the hardest to fix because you're just hoping that you can massage enough, uh, you know, multi-purpose solution onto this to be able to fix this. Um, a little pro tip that I like to say is as you're quickly observing each of those different scenarios or when you put your lens in, this is the best picture I could find, but um, having a little blue light, if you go to a, you know any of the annual conferences um, or honestly, if you ask your uh, distributor, they will give you these usually, but having a little blue light in your pocket just to pull out and just shine at the eyes can quickly show you these things without having to pull the slit lamp around, get the, get the patient all set up. Um, and it's a quick way to see, do I have central touch? Do I have any obvious thing that's not going to work? Or can I carry on and get this all, get this party going? So keep one of these in your pocket while you're fitting. Okay. So we've got our lens, we evaluated it, we have our fit, and now we need to know how to properly record information about your lenses. So there's different ways to do this, but having a systematic plan really helps. In the beginning, it's nice to draw out an option. I have kind of a drawing that's a common strategy, putting central clearance, how much lift, if things are aligned, if it's decentered, et cetera. But there is a lot of different um, resources that a lot of the different manufacturers give out or you can find online that really helps break down everything for you in a much more strategic and, you know, uh, making sure you're not missing any parameter. I think that it's important, especially in the beginning, to actually write all this information out because what sometimes you'll have a habit of doing is, for instance, we know, uh, I'm going to give a sp specific example. We know that with sagittal depth, for instance, we want around, let's say, 300 microns of clearance when the lens is first on, because we expect about 100 microns of, of settling, and we want to be around that 150, 200 micron, you know, height. That's that sweet spot that a lot of us talk about. But if you just write good or, you know, acceptable instead of a number for your clearance, then let's say a couple steps down, you need to make a change to the zone over the limbus or your, your peripheral zones. You, if you don't know the exact amount or at least the general amount of clearance that you had, then when you make changes, you're not going to be like, it. unfortunately, it gets you really frustrated at the end. So more information is better in the beginning. Writing down each of these different requirements that I've listed out is really helpful to make sure that you can make a change in the future and cover all your bases and not have to have your, your patient come back in or just take a guess and hope that you get it right. So a lot of the new lenses too, and a lot of the fitting sets have a toric uh, peripheral haptics. And that's super important to notate as well. Where are the markings on the lens? Every manufacturer has different types of markings. So mark that down. Um, but don't make these silly mistakes where you just didn't write enough. Also images, a lot of us nowadays have slit lamp cameras, taking images is super helpful because when you're on the phone talking to your consultants and they're doing your best to help you and you just didn't take enough information, you just want to kick yourself. So don't do that. Just keep keep all, all your notes as best as possible. Okay, ordering the lens. <laughs> this seems like a silly thing to go over, but it's something that's important to consider because there needs to be a process for this and things you should consider as you are ordering your lenses to make sure you do it accurately. So here are some tips that I have for you. Number one, this seems like a basic thing, but I do this for every scleral lens that I order. With my lenses, I always, always, always order them in two different colors. The only time this doesn't work is when you're ordering a larger diameter lens. So above, I believe an 18 millimeter, I don't think you can get in the blue, but lower than 16, I could be wrong. I, I should get corrected on that. But regardless, the blank size only goes up to a certain diameter for the blue color. Clear comes in everything, of course. But ordering two colors in your scleral lenses helps you and helps your patient. So I make all my right lenses clear. I tell patients clear has five letters like right and an R in it right, like right. Blue has four letters like left and an L in it. 
And that way they know and they keep themselves straight when I, it's so easy to fix a uh, patient when they come in and they say their vision's terrible and you just notice they switch their lens in the eye. So like, this is the easiest way. You don't have to go. You don't have to use your, your lensometer. You don't have to check anything out. You just see what color your lens is. You're wearing the wrong eye. Super easy. So two colors is an amazing, amazing tip. I highly recommend it. When you are ordering, check your power, check your map, check your over refraction, check what lens you used. I can't say it enough because it is super annoying and obnoxious to yourself when you realize you made a math error just because you, you maybe you had a lens that had 600 microns like we saw earlier, you knew you were gonna flatten it, but then you didn't do the stamp back <laughs> to be able to lower the power in the trial lens with your over refraction. So anyways, make sure you check your power. And then I call in all my orders. I'd say it's a huge tip that everyone as you're beginning to order lenses, you should call in all of your own orders just because you're going to you're going to learn from the consultants tips and nuances about the different lenses and how to modify them maybe in a different way or get different ideas about how to fix something that maybe you're not quite sure about and also ordering make sure you order on the same day especially for a complicated order or the early first thing you do the next morning because otherwise sometimes not only maybe you didn't take all the notes but the questions may come up that you that are fresh in your mind. So if you don't order it right away, you just, you might forget. And then when you are ordering, whether your consultant reads back to you or you read the order back to them at the end, all of transcription errors are so easy and all of us are human, it's really easy to do, but reading back what you ordered, it sounds like a simple thing, a simple tip, but it just helps save you, save you some heartache. So read back. Okay, when don't you order? This is, again, seems like a common question, but, or like a silly question, but I think it's worth talking about because there are some times where you go through a lot of effort in your fit and it's not worth the order, right? Like it depends on what your, your patient's goals are. So number one, your refractive endpoint is not where you where the patient wants it to be, right? So if the best corrective vision is, is, not what they were expecting or not better than their previous lenses or whatever it might be. If they're not getting the refractive endpoint that was your expectation or theirs, maybe a time that's not considered, not worth ordering. Um, an unacceptable fit is another thing. So when I, you can't confidently say that this patient is gonna have safe or healthy fit. Uh, an example that I could say is a scleral lens and a bled. Right. So you want to be super, super cautious about that in any scenario. And if you're just not confident that you can fit near or around that, that's a time I wouldn't order. Poor comprehension is another one. If you're kind of getting the feeling that maybe, maybe there is some early dementia on setting or the patient's just not understanding the experience or, or whatever it might be, that might be a time that is just not a not a good fit. And then lastly, of course, this is obvious, but if patients just not seeming to be interested or not kind of get in the picture and they decide to opt out, that's, they're not going to order. Okay, here I want to mention this lens disinfection because you you finished your order, you, you finished your fit, all that stuff, and now you have all these dirty lenses just sitting about waiting to use your next fitting. Um, nothing is worse. I'll, I'm going to say a quick story because I think it's worth it and Early on, I had a patient, I just fit it, finished fitting. She was fit because she had a herpetic ulcer and a large scar, residual scar, and she's still on acyclovir. Um, we all know now, and I'm several years out, so I, this wouldn't scare me, this is my fellowship. I was scared that like, am I gonna give another patient something viral in their eye? Like, how do I know I'm gonna totally disinfect this lens? Um, but from that, I actually did some research. So disinfecting, disinfecting your trial lenses, there's a couple of steps. So number one, you're going to put your lens in the original case. So not the clear care case. You're going to use hydrogen peroxide to cure the, to clean the lens. And you're going to soak it for three hours. You're going to rinse the lens and the case after that three hours with saline. 
and you're going to store the lens up to a month if you need in multi-purpose solution. So virus is actually, I've learned from this, virus is one of the easiest things to disinfect, but peroxide actually has bactericidal, virucidal, uh, mycobacterial, fungal, uh, fungicidal, sporocidal activity. So actually, even after the three hours, spores will die. Using the normal clear care in the normal case, that actually uh, cleans too fast for spores to die all the way. So if you're just going to use the case, that's not effective enough. Um, and this also removes biofilm from the case, so a great way to clean the case. Okay, I got another fun game that I ever want. I want everyone to vote on again. So your lenses that you have ordered have now arrived, and you have called your patient. They're coming in for their training visit, but we need to know. We have these lenses. Are they good enough to dispense? Okay. So here's the game again. The lens goes on and you're gonna tell me, should we dispense it or should we not dispense the lens? The lens is in the patient's eye and they say, this is so uncomfortable, I hate this, okay? You look at the fit, it looks okay, but they're like, I hate this, I don't, want, I don't know about this. My question is, do you dispense it? Not sure or absolutely not? But, Okay, nothing. Let's see our answers. Ah, a good split. Okay, 18% of you said yes. 43% are here for the answer. And 40% of you said no. I like that. Okay, for me, I would, I would definitely dispense this baby, right? Because a scleral lens is a large lens. If I look at the lens and the fit looks good and the feel looks good, to be honest, I'm not going to get excited if someone says it's uncomfortable. I'm going to look and see and maybe point out the things that might be causing a little issue. Usually with discomfort, the biggest thing that I find is a problem is actually edge lift. So I'm going to look for edge lift. But discomfort, it's a new lens, it's something brand new. Maybe they've never worn lenses before. It's not going to always feel magical, uh, like a scleral lens like we hear in the in fairy tales, right? It's usually your GP wear that thinks the scleral lens magical, but still it's a big lens and they have to get used to it. So comfort issue is not going to be a, a barrier to, to dispense. I'm going to actually tell them, let's try building up your wear time. I'm going to make this better for you. Maybe we'll add hydropeg. But again, honestly, by the end of the visit, most of the time they're like, actually, this is really good. This is feeling a lot better. Okay. Next question. There's a little central touch. Are you going to dispense this? Let's vote. Yes, maybe, or no. Like this, like this debate here. Hopefully you guys do too. Okay, and vote. Let's see the answers. All right, 64% or sorry, 62% say no, 17% say maybe, 20% say yes. Okay. So for me, I probably would not dispense um, if it's less than 80 microns. If I'm going to dispense, I'm going to do it with a very strong caveat that this is really a practice lens, you know, practice put on, practice to take off, maybe see for like an hour. But when a lens is settling too much, it's going to hurt. You know, we are definitely going to be reordering a new lens pronto. Usually I don't reorder a lens right away, but if there's central touch, definitely yes. But Probably there was an error, a calculation error, or something that happened to order a lens that flat, but obviously that's not something we want them to wear or accidentally put in their normal routine or accidentally keep and, and use in the future. So that's not something we want. Okay, another question. They put the lens in, great, but distance is pretty good, but I can't see anything up close, doctor. Do you dispense this or not? Both. All right, stop. Let's see. Yes, 67% say yes. 14% say no. 20% wanted to see what everyone else said. <laughs> I say definitely. I would definitely dispense this, right? Because this patient is probably, I mean, okay, if they're 20 years old, we made an error. But if they're 50 years old, then this is something we knew was coming, right? especially if they're a keratoconic patient, you know, you, you're taking away all of their nearsightedness, nearsightedness with these scleral lenses. 
very often it's good for anyone who's over even 35 to show your patient before you finish the fitting process, what their near vision will be like and kind of edge toward monovision or edge toward something, or even just give them the option straight up front. Do you want the option to see up close or, you know, have that conversation so you can curb this. But otherwise, I'm going to tell them, go run to your favorite drugstore, grab a pair of 150 or whatever would be appropriate. And in the future follow-ups, maybe we'll try out the idea of the multiple, or maybe we'll try out the idea of monovision. But this is not a reason to not dispense a lens, in my opinion. Okay. And last question is, what if their vision is worse? Do you dispense the lens? So, Okay, and no. Okay, 65% said no, 20% said maybe, 16 said yes. To be honest, I think in this situation, I probably would say I wouldn't dispense it. If it's getting worse, then it's gonna be a, a much harder for them to even use the lens. Um, we don't want them to actually drive, you know, drive with the lens that's making their vision worse. This probably was a math error. If anything, I might allow them to use it just for practice, but obviously doing whatever, like whatever calculation needs to be done to fix the vision, but that's not something we're going to dispense with the intention to use. I have had an accidental, you know, math error that worked out as monovision. So worse vision, but it was now, um, um, you know, magnifying eye and the patient ended up loving it. But normally speaking, that doesn't work out that nicely. And so usually you'll, I wouldn't dispense or would be ordering quickly the, the proper power. Okay, here, I wanna talk a little bit about training, okay? So you have done all the work in the world to get the lens into the eye. And that's great and Dan, or sorry, you made this beautiful lens for this patient. That's great and amazing. But if they can't put your beautiful lens in, this is all for nothing, right? That if you can't get the patient to train, like learn themselves, it's, it's it was worthless. So I want to just talk about a couple tips, right? So setup is important. Using your plunger is important. At least in the beginning, I like to start with that as a training. Their lids are the number one reason why they're not going to get the lens into the eye. So preparing them to or teaching them how to even open the eyelids is important. And then lastly, that you need to lift the lens straight onto the eye. For removing, using the separate plungers, the smaller plunger is a good first start because it does make it really easy. Placing the suction cup at the bottom edge, is, I think, is a good place to start. Some people like to use the top edge, but using a edge and avoiding the center of the lens, that's going to avoid that plungery effect on the lens, on the eye. And then lastly, as you remove the lens, to gently rock it away from the eye. Now, this comes up for sure, and I'm sure everyone can say that it's happened to them at least once, where your patient just cannot get the lens in. So now what? I'm going to talk about a couple tips here. So number one, I have the three-finger technique. This is really nice for previous either soft lens wearers or GP wearers. They kind of like this because they're used to using their fingers to get the lenses on and off. And using your fingers makes the lens uh, closer to your eye. Or sorry, your fingers closer to your eye. So sort of gives them a little better dexterity. So that's just another alternative option to try. The lit plunger. Shout out to my previous technician and extraordinaire, Hannah Smith. She came up with this genius little setup that she would use. Um, she was my technician. So I want to say real quick that you don't have to do all this work. You should have a team helping you because training a patient to use this sometimes can take five minutes and sometimes can take hours. And if everyone's on the same team being able to train, it's super helpful. So most people loved Hana more than they loved me, especially when it came to fitting their scleral lenses and learning how to fit their scleral lenses. So anyways, this little lit plunger <laughs> was in a Dixie cup, poked a hole from the top with a pen, and it was a little stand. So she would use it as she was training and it also allowed patients to use that as a tripod. So you could not use your hands to hold the plunger and just lean your face down to the to the to a cup if you wanted as well. So it was there to kind of give you a third hand or be a tripod, which is amazing. And then lastly is the S5 mini. So this is actually from Augmented Vision Labs. They have the S5 mini and the S5 
five inserter. Really awesome. It's a bit of an investment for patients. Comes with this little LED rechargeable thing. But what's cool about it is they actually have one-on-one -on -one coaching from their owner, uh, Dr. Magoo. Really awesome option. So uh, something to consider for for patients that maybe have mobility or dexterity issues and just want another option. Success kit is huge. Um, many of the labs now send these as well, but something that gives them either the cleaning solution, samples of the cleaning solution, uh, saline solution, plungers, cases, et cetera. It's really, really important because a lot of this stuff is actually hard to find out in real life. So giving them something is important. I'm going to, I always like, I'm going to just flash the slide. There's a lot of writing on it, but I like to highlight the more important recommendations in person, right? So no tap water, don't sleep in the lens, things like that when you're going to follow up. But more important to that, I give everyone an at-home guide. I like a printed form because um, there's so much to learn and you can't say it all or they're going to forget half of what you say. So I, I just, I put a couple pages on here so people could see kind of what I, like what I included, but just step by step of how to put it on, cleaning things, to how to not remove the lens, frequently asked questions, how long can I wear my lens? So I'll say to them, hey, we just went over all these things. It was a lot to learn. If you have a question, first look at the manual. There's so much in there. There's a lot of questions that we get got asked a lot. We put it in there. And then if not, call and reach out to us. And then also supplies. Where can you get these other things? Because they're going to go to the drugstore, they're going to go to their favorite, you know, Target, wherever. And if they can't find the things that they want, they're just going to buy something else. So if you don't give them a resource of where they can get everything, they just guess, and that that makes it really hard for them and, and risky because they'll end up using the wrong thing. Um, next up is follow up. So when are you going to see people back? Okay. So this is my general template that I follow for for new fits. Okay. So. When I, when I see people two to four weeks after I do the handling and training, see them back two to four weeks later to, for a follow-up, if the initial lens that we dispensed at the training was perfect, that's going to be potentially the final visit. If I needed to make any adjustments, I will see them on a two to four week cycle until the fit is perfect and you are seeing the final lens. Timing, of course, is highly reliant on shipping times in the past. I got lenses in a week or so and living in Costa Rica, I get it in three weeks or four weeks. So definitely different here, but anyways, giving your patients a little time to use the lens so they can come back with real feedback and um, giving the eye time to wear the lens is important. Follow up in the room. So these are some of the things I ask everyone to wear the lenses for two hours before evaluation. I mean this because I want to see the lens settled on the other. I'm gonna ask them questions both about vision, quality, how long they can wear it, what are they using to fill it, how are they taking it off, all that stuff. And then checking vision, checking over a fraction, and very important is removing the lens and checking the ocular surface, checking for stain. For reordering, um, it's this is again a nuanced thing, but kind of important. It's really important to document everything you you, you order and review all your old lenses. I'll say this because so often, I just gave this little example for the right eye. We order three different lenses. From the first to the second, we basically only change the base curve, the power is the same. From the second to the third, we change the power. But let's just say this patient decides to keep lens two. They like the vision in lens two better than lens three. They don't tell you that. And at the end of like you know next year, they come back and you think they're wearing lens three and not lens two. So having some sort of status tracker to show what lens they're wearing and, and collecting old lenses is super helpful. Otherwise you're just keeping yourself trying to figure out what they're wearing in the future when you should know because you ordered it, right? And everyone gets confused. Lastly is patient expectations. So patients always wanna know how often do I need to make this investment? I tell everyone, Plan to replace your lens every year or two. Of course, lenses can often last much longer than that. But beyond that, the lens is plastic and it tends to warp. Lens, the vision's not quite as sharp. The comfort's not quite as good. So plan around one or two years, you're going to be happy to get a new lens. Keep your returns organized again and planning for a future visit. So the future appointments, especially with a scleral lens, often just depends on the type of eye you're looking at. Most wearers, I say you should see them every year. 
if someone has a healthy eye, but they have any sort of previous surgery, like a transplant or PKP, I'm going to see them every six months just to make sure, because we know a transplant can fail at any time for any reason. So we want to be involved in knowing if that's happening sooner rather than later. And then lastly, fragile eye for whatever reason, sooner, so every three months. This is just a general guideline, but this, this is kind of the guidelines that I follow. And that's it. Thank you all so much for your attention. There is a much more detailed and advanced soiree coming up and you all should attend and that's all I got. <laughs>